the Prime Minister. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, we've just heard from that great sycophant of billionaires, the leader of both the sides, and we are going to make our country great again. Okay, each and every Thursday afternoon we have a chat with Mark Latham. He's got a fantastic uh, website. It's Facebook Outsiders. Hello, Mark. How are you this afternoon? I'm well, thanks, Brent. How are you going? Not too bad. How are you going in the football tipping? Well, it's a hard season. It's upside down world. It is, isn't it? Although, as a Dragons fan, it looks pretty good at the moment. Five and five. It does, yeah. I'm a bunny supporter, so I'm pretty sad at the moment, actually. Oh, they'll improve. The bunnies have, have had... Some good form, I think, and some unlucky results. I, I think they'll make the eight. Do you? Yeah, I think they've got a bit of class around the paddock and under the new coach they're going a lot better and I think you'll find as the season unfolds they'll, they'll really develop and, and improve. I, I, I think they'll come with a rush. I hope you're right. Looks like St George will definitely make the eight at the moment if things stay the same for them. They're doing oh, we're really known well. as the April Premiers. <laughs> <laughs> we, we start well every season and... Fire up, but sometimes they tail off. But you've got to hope with James Graham and Ben Hunt this season they'll be a bit more consistent at the back end. All right, we'll see how it goes. Tony Abbott's accused Malcolm Turnbull of misleading. Uh, read this 20,000 immigration cut proposal. He's laid into Malcolm Turnbull and some senior members of the government accusing them of being clever with words and getting their knickers in a twist. Of course, this comes on the back of, uh, I think it was in the Australian reporter that uh, Peter Dutton had proposed to reduce the 190,000 permanent migration intake by 20,000 places in talks with his cabinet colleagues. And it's gone on from there because Malcolm Turnbull said, no, it never happened. Well, Turnbull's probably been a bit slippery with his wording. He's saying he didn't go before Cabinet, but you can still have discussions informally between Cabinet members as to a policy like this, which would obviously be a big deal. So it sounds like Peter Dutton must have put this up the flagpole at some stage, had a chat with some senior Cabinet members, and ultimately was knocked back by Turnbull and Scott Morrison. And I think that's the point Tony Abbott's making today that obviously something's gone on behind the scenes. Abbott himself has been pushing for a bigger cut to the immigration program so it sounds like the Turnbull government's uh, divided on this issue. My own view is that Australia's immigration program is way too big. Uh, in New Zealand for instance the new government there said you want to take the pressure off housing affordability, off urban sprawl, off uh, sluggish wages growth and cutting immigration is a smart thing to do. And that was a Labor government, so I don't think there'd be any problem if a Liberal government here did something similar. Mark, how much do you think they should cut? How many do you think they should cut by? Well, I'm on the side of a much smaller Australia. I think our cities are getting way too big, and you look at our labour market needs. There are Australians who are looking for a job or could be trained into these positions. We don't need family reunion on the scale we've had. We don't need skilled migration on the scale we've had. The... 20th century average in Australia was 70,000 a year, and I think that did a pretty good job. And uh, over a couple of years, I'd return it to the 70,000 level that we had through most of last century. I think 190,000 is way off the radar, way too big. OK, if we were, were to reduce it to 70,000, what does that do to the government's coppers? Well, this is the point, uh, and, and Tony Abbott has built the cat on this. Tony Abbott says every year Treasury says, oh, you can't cut immigration, you can't at immigration, we need to bring around 200,000 extra people into the country. They bring money with them. It's inbuilt economic growth. And in fact, each year, Australia's economic growth figure, two-thirds of it is comprised or comes from the immigration intake. And only one-third comes from genuine economic growth. Australians are more productive, businesses are more successful. You know, we're, we've sort of got a, um, a false dawn. We're, we're, we're in a a state of delusion here about the true state of the economy. We've, we've had 26 years of continuous economic growth according to the statistics, but the statistics are massively pumped up artificially by the immigration intake, and, and that's why you've got someone like Treasurer Scott Morrison opposing a cut. So, uh, you know, I think they've got to be honest with the Australian people and say, look, I want to grow the economy, do it the right way, instead of relying on big immigration year by year, which causes massive problems in other areas. Because it's fair to say, is it, Mark, that if uh, we didn't rely on the high immigration intake to put towards the figures, uh, you would get your two, um, you would get your two uh, successful, uh, two successive. I'm sorry. Um, what do they call it? Well, you need two successive uh, orders of negative economic uh, growth to have a recession. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah, we would have had a recession or two in that 26-year period. 
So it has been sort of a false impression of how well the Australian economy is going. But, you know, Brent, you look, you talk to the average person, they'll say, look, it's not going fantastic. I haven't had a wage increase for three or four years. Things are, are, are not what the headline statistic points to. So, you know, I think everyone would be better off if we were just, the government just said, look, we're going to try and do other things to grow the economy instead of big Australia migration. Yeah, gee, there's a lot of people that ring this radio station and network, I mean, on the network, that uh, that would agree with you, what you say 100%. I mean, I don't think I... Rarely do you get someone that says, no, well, let's keep the immigration numbers at, at what they are. It's really the big retailers, some of the big corporate people and some boffins in the Treasury Department who are worried about uh, the impact on headline economic growth. So, you know, there's a lot of self-interest in this debate, but if you live in the outer suburbs, if you live in the regions, if you're looking for a job, if you're worried about housing affordability, people quite sensibly say for a country our size, 200000 a year is way too much. We've got just about the biggest immigration program in the Western world, and it doesn't have to be that way. Yeah. Look, there's a story today uh, that you want to talk about. It wasn't on page one. Thankfully, it was on page two, and it's about Australian uh, the war memorials, it says that thousands of World War I memorials in country towns across Australia are in danger of being lost as erosion, neglect and vandalism take their toll. No matter what small country town you go to, there's always some form of memorial there to World War I. And you, it, it, the article is right when you read through it. I mean, thankfully, there are some organisations and some wonderful people who do all this work for nothing. And they are basically tasks with the job of maintaining these memorials. Yeah, I think they should be seen as a huge national asset, an important part of our history, honouring uh, the Anzacs, the war dead, teaching young people the, Australia, the history of Australian war service. And I, I think, Brent, there's been a missed opportunity here. I think with the centenary of Anzac in 2015, there should have been a big national effort headed by the federal government to say, here's a list of all the significant war memorials around Australia. They're coming up to 100 years old, which, you know, puts them in risk of falling apart and disrepair. Let's have a big national effort with some government money, community contributions and corporate uh, donations to see if we can have local committees that restore each of these memorials to their proper glory uh, by the time we celebrate or mark the uh, centenary of the end of, of World War One, as we will in November this year. So from the, the date of Anzac, 25th of, of April um, uh, 2015, right through to the 11th of November this year. You know, you've, you had over three years there to put together a national program to make sure these memorials last another 100 years. Yes. Yeah. And we've missed that opportunity. Where was the leadership? You know, I, I'm passionate about this because I live at a place called Mount Hunter mm -hmm. in southwest Sydney, just on the outskirts of Camden, uh, what was a small farming community. But around 45 uh, local lads signed up for the, the war effort uh, in, 2000, in, in 1914. Some of them went on to um, Gallipoli, and they're all listed there on our uh, war memorial uh, outside the local public school, and it had fallen into disrepair. Who was looking after it? I spoke to the local council. They didn't know. The school said, look, you know, we've obviously got education funding priorities. The local RSL said, oh, we haven't sort of heard about that for a while. So I got some people together, and we raised some money from corporate, local. The RSL was great. The local council finally got involved, and we restored it. We, we spent twenty or $30,000 to restore the memorial, and people drive past it now and, and, and think, well, that was Mount Hunter's contribution. Those yeah. young men, a lot of them didn't come back. That's right. And the young students at the, stu at the school at least can look at a functioning restored war memorial and take pride in the Australian achievement in that terrible conflict. So I think there should have been a big national drive to do, do that, that sort of thing right around the country. And to see the, the report today is distressing, actually, because it's a missed opportunity. Yeah, you're right, a missed opportunity, and hopefully the report will uh, motivate some, some organisation to, uh, to pick up the ball and run with it so that you know, government can uh, stick their hand in their pocket and uh, find some money to do some good. Well, it's not too late. It's not too late. Uh, the, 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 the federal government could announce this now and say, look, uh, to mark the centenary of the end of World War I in November, we'll launch the program then. So I would urge uh, anyone to ring up their local federal member of parliament, state member of parliament and say, listen, can we make this a big national program? The newspaper today talks of over 7,000 of these memorials and, 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 and old military items around the country. And it, it should be a major effort. We don't do enough in Australia to respect, restore and honour 
our history. And we talk about the war dead in Anzac. Well, let's make it real in our local communities instead of the tragedy of ever seeing these memorials literally fall over or just become so um, uh, unwanted and, and, and disused that they sort of become irrelevant in the local community. That would be a tragedy. It would, absolutely. Uh, the White House says that no decisions have yet been made on a possible attack on Syria. Uh, the President warns that missiles, what did he say, missiles will be coming down. I think he tweeted, did he not? They're new, they're smart and they're something else in his, uh, in his tweet about Syria. Well, it's a long way from us, and Australia's got no direct involvement. It's a terrible thing. The Assad regime would use chemical weapons against their own citizens, uh, including children. This happened about 14 months ago, and Trump acted with a military response that at least seemed to buy 14 months of uh, better behaviour from the Assad regime. The thing that worries me, though, is that the, the, the Russian government supports the... Uh, regime in Syria and in that context Trump has also tweeted out that American Russian relations are worse than they've ever been including during the Cold War yeah. you know what does that mean including the, the Cuban Missile Crisis so I'm not what, what happened in Syria was terrible but Australia's got no direct responsibility the French and British might might get involved along with the Americans in terms of some response I'm more worried about the deterioration in American Russian relations where two nuclear superpowers it's in everyone's interest right around the world for them to have um, uh, you know productive talks and and cordial relations uh, for world stability and avoiding the the, the possibility of uh, any serious conflict how much of the ego is involved with the two leaders do you think well they had made an attempt more than any other uh, leaders to to get along and and trump actually campaigned on the theme of why does Russia need to be America's enemy? And, and I think there's a lot of sense in that. Um, Trump is also saying that the uh, whole um, scandal or um, um, fabricated story about Russian interference uh, delivering Trump the presidency and the investigations in Washington, that is one of the sources in the deteriorating relationship between these two nuclear superpowers. So, you know, unfortunately, politics has soured the relations that Trump and Putin were trying to establish as two leaders, as two men. And hopefully, um, you know, Trump can do something to achieve two important things. One, for Putin not to support the Assad regime mm -hmm. and to firmly condemn uh, use of chemical weapons. And the second thing is to get back to the idea that there's no reason why the United States and, and Russia, with the Cold War, you know, what, decades um gone by now there's no reason those two nations need to be enemies true true we wait with bated breath the uh, the com games they've come they've almost gone we have done incredibly well haven't we oh the athletes have been superb absolutely magnificent uh, i think we spoke a week ago that maybe there wouldn't be as much public enthusiasm but at the end of the day uh, you know australians love a winner don't they they do so yeah. i think the nation has rallied around the athletes the swimmers in particular have been magnificent uh, I'm not too sure, though, for Queenslanders it's been the best run games. It's pretty disturbing to see those reports of a ghost town there, that they haven't got the tourists, some of the cafes and restaurants haven't had the trade and the bonanza they were promised. So I don't know if it's been poorly run up there. It's probably a paradox where the locals have thought Gold Coast will be so crowded during the games, I'll, I'll, I'll take my holiday elsewhere right now. Uh, other people haven't come in, so it, 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 it's been a bit of a vacuum in terms of the commercial impact. I know there's been... The silly part about it is, I mean, this has happened in other games, in both Olympic and, and Commonwealth Games prior, uh, before. So, you know, you'd think they'd learn by the mistake. And, and unfortunately for the for retailers and for restaurateurs and cafe owners, etc., they haven't learned by their mistake, and it was a ghost town, literally. I believe people are starting to come back into town now because the rhetoric has changed. Oh, you even had Peter Beattie the other, so, other day saying, look, I may get into trouble for saying this, but, you know, come back, come back, come back, please. Well, whoever told them to go out? Shouldn't they have been saying for 12 months, stay in the Gold Coast, spend your dollars here, be part of the games? I mean, I, 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 that, that's a, a, a terrible thing to consider, that your local community would be hosting the Commonwealth Games, but local residents feel like they've got to leave town. I think there should have been a, a better understanding of what this was all about. And maybe the organisers, we've said this previously, they were worried a lot about politically correct stuff. You can't say, ladies and gentlemen, uh, greeting people, all this sort of PC madness. Maybe the organisers, instead of worrying about the PC stuff, should have been focusing on the commercial 
realities and getting a more realistic message out to the locals to say, come and this is your Commonwealth Games, come and be part of it. That's right, yeah. It's, uh, but anyway, it looks like we're at the top of the pops and we'll stay that way, which is good news. Yeah, we beat New Zealand, that's all yeah, that's all. That's the main thing, isn't it? We beat New Zealand in the Poms. Well, we've, we're beating the Poms at the moment anyway. And it I think we're, much better than that. It doesn't, does it? I think we're so far in front, no one can catch up to us. Mark Latham, I've got to go to the news. It's always a great chat. Thanks, mate, for spending so much time with us. We really appreciate it. Remember Mark Latham's Outsiders. It's great. Great Facebook website. Thanks very much, Brent. We'll talk next week. Cheers. I hope the uh, the Dragons win on the weekend, mate. See you next week. Bye. Bye-bye. That's Mark Latham.